right, thank you for attending. Uh, my name is Irfan Kirani, and I'm a glaucoma specialist at the University Health Network at the University of Toronto. And I'm excited to discuss with you today an approach to the assessment and management of primary angle closure disease. Now, this is a topic that has absolutely changed over the past uh, couple of decades. And so uh, our goal today is really to understand how the mechanism driving angle closure can be used to outline the best managed for our patients. To start, here's a quick uh, summary just of my disclosures, none of which are particularly relevant today, uh, but I have received honoraria from uh, the companies that are listed here. Much of what I'm gonna discuss today comes from these two very, very important guidelines. The terminology and guidelines for glaucoma published by the European Glaucoma Society have been recently updated and make reference to some of the newest and most pivotal trials that really guide our practice. Secondly, the primary angle closure disease preferred practice pattern from the American Academy of Ophthalmology led by Stephen Getty is honestly a fantastic resource, not only for glaucoma specialists, eye care professionals and practicing optometrists and ophthalmologists, but also those in training hoping to get a better sense or some background onto the approach to primary angle closure disease. Today, we'll first discuss some relevant background, uh, followed by the assessment of primary angle closure disease, focusing first on the staging and subsequently on the mechanism driving that angle closure. Based on that assessment, we'll move on to the management or in order to determine the safest plan first based on mechanism, but after that based on staging. Now, many other webinars have focused on the approach to the acute angle closure crisis or acute angle closure glaucoma. And while I will make reference to it today, it will not be the primary focus for today's session. So before we start discussing whether or not to shoot lasers or do surgery, let's start off with certain background. When seeing a patient with potential primary angle closure disease, these are the types of risk factors that we want to elicit on past medical history. While there's no clear cutoff for age, many clinicians suggest that an age of greater than about 50 years is a point at which angle closure becomes clinically relevant. That being said, I'm sure many of us have seen patients with advanced glaucoma that present much early in the, earlier than this. And honestly, I can actually think of a patient right now that I'm managing who presented just a few weeks ago at the very young age of 17 with very advanced primary angle closure glaucoma already affecting his central fixation. Females are statistically more likely to develop angle closure. However, being is certainly not a reason for exclusion. And like most types of glaucoma, family history and genetic predisposition very much play a role. But unlike our classic or primary open angle glaucoma, racial background plays a particularly strong role in establishing risk for angle closure glaucoma. Patients of Inuit and Chinese background have a particularly high prevalence of angle closure. Up to 4% of Inuit patients are diagnosed with this group of diseases. Now, I'm fortunate to have spent some time in Nunavut in the Northern Territory in Canada, treating patients of Inuit origin, and their version of angle closure is very pronounced with very, <clears throat> very thick irises, often requiring very lengthy lasers to help manage. Now, while the Inuit and Chinese populations are more likely to be affected by angle closure, not being one of these races is once again, not an exclusion factor. When assessing anyone with angle closure, patients of African origin or European origin, they can and still are affected by angle closure glaucoma. And as such, even with a prevalence of around 0.5%, we should be mindful of their race and origin. While clinical history is important in all of medicine, clinical exam plays a particularly and distinctly important role in risk stratification in angle closure glaucoma. Now, admittedly, all of us look for patterns in our practice. And so whenever I see a patient in my clinic with a history of hyperopia or, you know, thick glasses or bottle glasses or a short axial length, I immediately start thinking about angle closure, largely because these patients have a relatively thick crystalline lens relative to the size of their eye. As such, whenever I see patients with hyperopic correction, shallow or central, uh, shallow peripheral or central anterior chamber depths, steep corneal curvatures, specifically thick crystal lenses or short axial lengths, and as well anterior lens positioning, I automatically start thinking about angle closure and important complete a gonioscopy assessment. Now, 
Of note, patients that have plateau iris, another mechanism that drives ankle closure glaucoma, which we'll discuss a bit later on, these patients often don't follow these classic clinical characteristics. As such, really any patient that is coming in for a glaucoma assessment should be considered a candidate for ankle closure glaucoma. With that in mind, direct visualization of the interior chamber angle with dynamic gonioscopy in a dark room is, and will likely continue to be the gold standard for determining angle closure. However, as our imaging modalities improve, our ability to record ourselves and more importantly, show these images to our patients will likely continue to change our approach to angle closure moving forwards. Anterior segment imaging, like I've shown here, whether it be through OCTs or UBMs, it's really proving to be an invaluable resource in the assessment of angle closure. When using these modalities, however, we must be careful not to depend on the automatic measurements and conclusions created by these devices. We must read the imaging ourselves. Whenever using an anterior segment OCT, for example, showcased right here, before even looking at the angle on the image that I have, I first ensure that the pupil is dilated, include indicating dark room completion of the test itself. The last thing you want is to create some sort of false sense of reassurance because the imaging produced was completed incorrectly. I really refrain from using the automatic IC angle measurements. As you can see on this image, they are susceptible to a significant, significant amount of artifact. And for that reason, I prefer to gonio the patient and then compare it to the imaging that we produced. Now, progression with our imaging, with the increasing use of artificial intelligence will continue to improve almost by nature of artificial intelligence. However, we should always confirm our assessments that are aided by technology. For certain type of mechanisms that we will discuss today, anterior segment OCT will adequately um, image the anatomy in question. Things like pupil block and lens rise. However, if we are interested in assessing things like plateau iris, we do need to ensure that ultrasound imaging is completed in order to visualize the ciliary body. Anterior segment OCT does not have the required penetration to visualize ciliary body. As such, dynamic gonioscopy, which I've mentioned before, is still the gold standard. And it's really only the dynamic gonioscopy that can be used to formally diagnose angle closure and its constituent mechanisms. So with that bit of background, let's move on to our assessment of the primary angle closure disease patient. Our first step in any designation or assessment is to determine the stage of the glaucoma. Whether you look at the general glaucoma textbooks or the academy publications or the EGS guidelines, angle closure disease is pretty much always subdivided into three constituent diagnoses. The summary table that I've presented here is taken from the EGS guidelines document. So level one, primary angle closure suspect. Primary angle closure suspect patients have iridotrabecular contact observed on gonioscopy, and of course, without compression, where, there's con where contact is described as the iris touching the pigmented trabecular meshwork or any structure anterior to that for at least 180 degrees. Now, there can be no increased intraocular pressure and no scar tissue or posterior anterior sneakia. Furthermore, the patient cannot have any existing glaucomatous optic neuropathy or associated visual field defect. Now, a couple of important notes. First off, for those of us who are still mastering gonioscopy, a skill, honestly, this is a, a skill that is still changing every day for me. I heavily recommend gonioscopy.org. It's a great academic resource on how to approach and diagnose pathology on gonioscopy. Uh, so definitely refer to gonioscopy.org if you're trying to master that skill. And second, a lot, of, uh, a lot of clinicians will ask why we use this 180 degree rule. Why is it that an angle is considered open if less than 180 degrees are occluded? So honestly, in short, the de definition of 180 degrees of irotrabecular contact is really based more off of a consensus agreement. We have no formal scientific reason to argue why 180 degrees of patients put more at risk than 90 degrees, for example, but logically that would seem to be the case. Honestly, the formal diagnosis of angle closure is less important with that 90 versus 180 degree standpoint, but if a patient is you know, only closed at 90 degrees at the age of 45, as they get older and their lenses become bigger, my guess is their risk for ankle closure will increase moving forwards. 
next. On to level two. Uh, if the patient has 180 degrees of irritotrabecular contact, but there is either increased IOP or some posterior anterior sneakia, we use the term primary angle closure. These patients, like those that are PACS, still do not have any formal glaucomatous optic neuropathy or formal visual field defect. Finally, on to level three, if all the previous conditions are met and the patient does show some signs of an optic neuropathy and or some sort of characteristic glaucomatous visual change, we use the term primary angle closure glaucoma. We add on that last term. Now, a quick note on the acute angle closure crisis. Patients with irritotrabecular contact with an acute rise in IOP are said to have developed an acute angle closure crisis. These patients are the classically described presentation with an acute rise in intraocular pressure associated with corneal edema, a mid-dilated pupil, and vascular congestion. These patients often have eye pain with headache, nausea, and vomiting. Now, as a bit of a stickler for uh, terminology, you'll likely note that I did not use the term acute angle closure glaucoma. Patients who present with an acute angle closure crisis, while by definition have closed angles and an increased IOP, they may or may not have actual glaucomatous optic neuropathy and or visual field defects associated with it. So if managed early enough and the crisis is broken, they may actually never develop glaucomatous optic neuropathy. Though, of course, if it's, there's any sense of delay, that risk of optic nerve compromise is very, very high. So bringing us back to that staging summary, PACS patients have at least 180 degrees of irritotrabecular contact. However, there's no associated IOP or, or PAS and certainly no optic nerve damage. PAC patients or primary angle closure patients have elevated pressures or some signs of posterior anterior sneakia and PACG or primary angle closure glaucoma patients have some level of associated glaucomatous optic neuropathy whether that be thrown, shown through thinning of the RNFL or glaucomatous visual field defects. Now, let's move on to kind of part two of that assessment. And in my opinion, probably the most interesting part, which is the mechanism that's driving that angle closure. So far, we've defined angle closure based on 180 degrees of irotrabecular contact. But What's the cause of that angle closure? What is the eyes, why is the eyes physiologic drainage system closed off and not functioning correctly? So mechanism one is pupil block. So pupil block is thought to be the most common mechanism affecting, it's estimated around 75% of patients with primary angle closure. And pupil block occurs when there's a relative seal that forms between the iris and the lens trapping the aqueous right here uh, behind the iris in front of the anterior capsule. So when assessing for pupil block, we look for this rounding of the iris and specifically this connection that, that connects the central um, iris and the anterior lens capsule. So while these patients may have peripheral shallowing, as we see over here, secondary to that bowing of the iris, they may have a fairly deep or a relatively deep central anterior chamber. Mechanism number two is lens rise. And lens rise is the phenomenon when the whole lens complex is anteriorly positioned, causing both central and peripheral anterior chamber shallowing. Formally, we define lens rise as a reduced perpendicular, so that's this distance here, anterior posteriorly distance, between the crystalline lens and the angle recess to angle recess line. So these patients typically have both peripherally and centrally shallow anterior chambers. And honestly, I think one of my favorite terms in glaucoma management is the volcanic lens rise that we can see in these two UBMs here. And this occurs when that, again, that whole lens complex is, appears to have been pushed forward, typically found in smaller eyes or relative anterior microphthalmic eyes. So in these patients, look for that iris contour that follows the contour of the anterior lens capsule. Finally, mechanism three that we're gonna talk about is plateau iris. And in these patients, the ciliary body 
behind the iris is anteriorly rotated, causing the peripheral anterior chamber to shallow. And in doing so as a secondary result, causing the angles to close. These patients honestly are far more challenging to identify because the central anterior chamber is pretty much always relatively deep. And so when we do our quick screens looking for a shallow anterior chamber, they often get missed. Plateau iris is the reason, in my opinion, why every patient undergoing a glaucoma assessment requires low light gonioscopy. Like so many cases in medicine, our patients are often some combination of all of these mechanisms. This anterior segment OCT here that I'm showing you shows the anterior lens positioning. So this pushed forward of the, of the whole lens complex itself that's characteristic of lens rise, but also has this rounding of the pupil that with a small connection that does report or show some signs of pupil block. Now, because this is a light-based OCT, we can't formally assess for plateau iris, uh, the lack of imaging of the ciliary body. However, it could also very much be present. So with that staging and mechanism background, what do we do? How do we manage these patients? Depending on who you talk to, every specialist will likely give you a different way or approach of managing patients with angle closure. Now, some say in general, start with laser peripheral iridotomy. Others say that laser is not really needed because of the low risk of actually developing glaucoma in the term. And you know, if a cataract is present, jump straight to lens extraction. My argument and overall thesis today for you is that you should treat the underlying mechanism and that should largely drive our decision-making process moving forwards. So part one of management, management how can we use the mechanism to define our treatment? If the mechanism driving the angle closure is clearly pupil block, as is the case in this image here, where we see that rounding and that contact directly onto the anterior lens capsule, we can clearly see how a peripheral lasural iridotomy will help alleviate this mechanism by directly relieving the impact of the relative seal between the iris and the anterior capsule of the lens. We can see that by inserting a hole right here, sorry, here, a hole right here in the peripheral iris, we can establish an equalization or an equilibrium between the anterior chamber and the sulcus space, thereby flattening out the iris and hopefully opening up that angle. So if you have pupil block given the low risk associated with peripheral iridotomy, consider peripheral iridotomy. If the primary mechanism is lens rise, we can see that simply doing a peripheral iridotomy in the peripheral iris likely won't resolve the actual angle closure. The underlying mechanism is not an imbalance of the pressure between the anterior chamber and the sulcus space. So simply putting in that hole in the peripheral iris will not resolve the underlying mechanism, which is this large lens pushing everything forward. So truly, to fix or open an angle in a patient with lens rise, really the only underlying option is to consider lens extraction. When discussing the third mechanism, plateau iris, the potential to resolve this mechanism is, is a little bit less clear. Traditionally, we spoke of using a peripheral iridotomy to help resolve any associated pupil block component, which often honestly presents in combination with plateau iris, followed by some sort of inter intervention to reduce that plateau iris configuration, which could be laser iridoplasty, for example. Now, the studies honestly aren't completely clear whether iridoplasty has a positive effect in the long term. And honestly, if you complete uh, iridoplasty, there is a concern of developing long term posterior anterior sneakia. So, other options that you can consider for the management of plateau iris configuration could include use myotic agent such as pilocarpine, which will constrict the pupil, pulling this peripheral iris away from the angle, or we could consider something called endocyclophotocoaguloplasty. You know, it's a long term there, or ECPL, where we actually treat the ciliary body directly with photocoagulation in order to rotate that ciliary body posteriorly and thereby helping the iris to pull back and open the angle. Now of note, ECPL can only really be done in a pseudophagic patient. So either the treatment needs to be done during cataract surgery or needs to be after cataract surgery if you still have persistent um, plateau iris configuration. 
All right. How about the future of, of uh, plateau iris configuration? So Dr. Ahmed has started doing a mid-pupillary peripheral, sorry, a mid-peripheral pupillary cerclage. So in this picture here, I'm showcasing how he's performing a central pupillary cerclage. But if you do a mid-peripheral pupillary cerclage, there is an argument that you can again pull that iris forward, and in doing so, hopefully opening up the angles. Now. Unfortunately, there's no kind of big study to argue whether or not a mid peripheral pupillary cerclage will open the angles, but it definitely makes sense from an anatomical and structural standpoint. So stay tuned. Hopefully we have some more guidance in the future. Practically, as we made reference a bit before, many of our patients or have some combination of these different mechanisms. And as such, we really need to determine to the best of our abilities what the dominant mechanism is, and from there, work in a stepwise approach. We must always, however, take into account the risks of treatment. If a patient is PACS secondary to lens rise, for example, mechanism-based decision-making would argue that we proceed with lens extraction. However, does that make logical sense? Should every patient with narrow angles secondary to lens rise undergo surgery to manage a condition that they may or may never actually encounter. Complicating things further, when the OL has been closed for an extended period of time, so say a patient's presenting in their 80s or 75 or 95, the trabecular meshwork itself may develop some secondary dysfunction. So that even if we are open, able to open at the angle with laser or cataract surgery, for example, it may not adequately manage the glaucoma. And for that reason, many of our advanced primary angle closure patients require more intervention. We will talk a bit about this a bit later on, so stay tuned. So for that reason, let's move on to our last section, management based on staging. Let's first talk about PACS. These patients have anatomical changes that put them at risk for high IOP, and glaucoma. However, they have no diagnosed true pathology. If the underlying mechanism is pupil block, it seems very reasonable to consider peripheral iridotomy, though I would encourage everyone to ensure that they review the results of the ZAP trial from 2019. Of the 889 people that were randomized first to laser peripheral iridotomy and to observation, only 19 people reach the endpoint of either an increased pressure of greater than 24 or some signs of posterior anterior sneak gate, or an episode of an angle closure glaucoma in the treatment group, sorry, in, in the treatment group, and only 36 reach that endpoint in the observation group. So we're looking really at a risk of only 4% with just observing patients with primary angle closure suspect disease. And if we do treat them with peripheral iridotomy, that risk drops from around 4% down to 2%. So as such, if, if a patient presents with PACS secondary to pupil block, it's honestly very reasonable to consider observation or laser peripheral iridotomy, especially if there are any other risk factors such as family history or contralateral PACG or kind of other things. And this is really where that conversation with the patient becomes so, so important. So how about lens rise? Given the low risk, you know, I mean, we talked a bit about 4% to even just developing primary angle closure, the risk of developing primary angle closure glaucoma necessitating lens extraction in a patient with primary angle closure suspect disease seems to be a little bit of an overkill. So for me, if there is underlying lens rise, sorry, if there's some underlying pupil block in my patients with large lens rise angle closure, I would certainly offer a peripheral iridotomy, but I'm really not stepping up to lens extraction for my patients with lens rise who have simply primary angle closure suspect disease. For patients with plateau iris, once again, after managing any associated pupil block component with peripheral iridotomy, you could certainly consider pilocarpine or iridoplasty, though given that the patient really doesn't have a formal glomitus damage or diagnosis, again, this type of treatment may be unnecessary. So, Let's move on to that level two, the patients that are primary angle closure. To review, these patients have closed angles with either increased IOP of greater than 21 millimeters of mercury or some signs of scarring in the form of posterior anterior synechia. Now, here's really where the art of medicine comes into play. So observation is still an option. However, I think 
most of us would probably be willing to offer some sort of treatment given the higher risk of progression to true glaucoma disc damage. So patients with pupil block that are primary angle closure, whether there'd be a little bit of the higher of increased IOP or some PAS, I'm pretty likely to recommend uh, laser peripheral iridotomy as a great initial management plan. Now, an important note, you doing or completing a peripheral iridotomy in a patient with PAS, it's not going to open or remove that existing scar tissue. However, the hope is by equilibrating the dynamics in the anterior chamber relative to the sulcus space, you can still help open the remaining areas that are not scarred down. Patients with lens rise are a bit more challenging. If they have a pupil block component, once again, definitely consider a PI. However, jumping straight to lens extraction or cataract surgery for a patient that has, let's say, a pressure of just 22 millimeters of mercury still seems a little bit aggressive in my view. So we can use the EGO study that, I've, that has been summarized here by a, a great infographic created by Feng et al. to provide us some guidance. However, in order to be included in the EGO study in patients that have primary angle closure, they didn't need just an IOP or a pressure of 21 millimeters of mercury that we use in our diagnosis. They needed a pressure of 30 millimeters of mercury. So that cutoff is much higher than we use really to determine normal versus high OP on our daily practice. So clearly jumping to lens extraction, that's, it's a bit of a step I have to admit even for me. So if the patient has a concurrent cataract, decision is very simple, we should go straight to lens extraction. If they don't have really any significant cataract and their pressures are, you know, 22, 23, 24, 25, I'm actually more likely to treat them with drops as a bridge to potential lens extraction in the not too distant future. Now, I will say that my patients that have primary angle closure, whether it be pressure-based or posterior anterior sneakia, my threshold to do cataract surgery in them is undoubtedly lower than my patients with open angles. Uh, for my patients with plateau iris, once again, after imaging like lens rise, consider proceeding with um, lens extraction with some sort of laser to help open or rotate the iris. But like our previous lens rise case, if the pressure is relatively low, again, there's by definition no specific signs of glaucomatous optic neuropathy, it would be reasonable to proceed with drops as a bridge to lens extraction in the not too distant future. Finally, Let's go to primary angle closure glaucoma. Now, for me, all of the options that we've talked about today are all a consideration. If a patient has true primary angle closure glaucoma, meaning they have, where they have some sort of optic neuropathy, whether it be in the form of thinning of the RNFL or visual field defects, a mechanism-based treatment should absolutely be offered as first-line treatment. If it's pupil block, plan for PI, with the only exception that if they are planning for lens extraction, a PI may not likely be necessary. If it's lens rise, I'm pretty much planning on lens extraction. And especially even though it is surgical and there is surgical intervention at this point, I think those benefits of preventing the progression of glaucoma outweigh the risks of the cataract or lens-based surgery at that point in time. And if the patient is plateau iris, I'm likely considering lens extraction and putting in a combination endocyclophotocoagulopathy to really help rotate that iris and keep the angle open. Now, as we made reference to a bit before, often when the angle has been closed for an extended period of time, the patient may develop a secondary trabecular meshwork dysfunction. So in these cases, in these cases, I do have a relatively low threshold to even add on a combined minimally invasive glaucoma surgical procedure, typically something of angle origin, and often I step up to a gonioscopy assisted transluminal trabeculotomy, largely described by Devinder Gover and the, and the Texas Associates. Uh, it's a really good procedure that often works very synergistically with the cataract surgery itself and really helps to open up the drainage system as well as open up the angles and the approach to the angles. Only rarely will I consider stepping up to a combined filtering procedure whether that be an anterior blood surgery like a trabeculectomy or a pressure flow or a zen or a posterior blood surgery such as a tube shunt. It's really only in the very, very elderly patients that present with very, very high pressures 
that I will consider doing a combined cataract surgery with a filtering surgery in patients with primary angle closure glaucoma. And really it's only in the patients where the last thing I would want would be to go back to the operating room in the future. And so if I want something truly definitive, I'm really looking to a tube shunt surgery in combination with cataract surgery. But again, I really only step up to combined cataract with filtering surgery in my PACG patients in very, very rare circumstances. So let's get on to some questions and some polls to kind of see where all of us are at. So case number one, a patient with primary angle closure suspect with lens rise and some pupil block. So why don't we open up that poll to the group and uh, let's see what people think. So for that, we'll give you a couple of seconds to answer your quest to answer the poll and we'll see where that takes us. Awesome. So uh, we're hearing, again, the, the biggest kind of uh, option here that we've seen is 50% of patients are considering peripheral iridotomy. Uh, some are, uh, small proportion are considering lens extraction. So honestly, my counseling of PACS patients really focuses on what the patient's risk tolerance is. If they want to do whatever they want, they whatever they can to really prevent glaucoma, I'll likely recommend a peripheral iridotomy, similar to kind of exactly what, you know, 50% of the group said today. If they are more adverse to intervention, given honestly that low risk of progression, it's only about 4% to primary enclosure. Um, I think observation is honestly very reasonable for them. Uh, for those that kind of went in the direction of lens extraction, I think that's also a reasonable choice, especially if they have a coexisting cataract, in which case do the cataract surgery and their angles automatically open up and you've managed their cataract as well as their ankle closure. So very reasonable choice. We'll move on to case number two a patient with primary angle closure with a slightly high pressure just of 22 millimeters of mercury with what appears to have a plateau iris configuration as well as some pupil blocks. And let's see what people said. So again, uh, this one's a little bit more varied. 37% of patients, uh, sorry, 30% of participants recommended peripheral iridotomy, 31% uh, to pilocarpine, uh, and then down to 9% just to observation. For this, Again, I think all of these options would be reasonable depending on the patient's risk tolerance. I have to say that with that rising pressure, I'm likely heading away from observation and moving towards peripheral iridotomy to start. And if the pressure still uh, is high or persists after that, um, probably pilocarpine, if the, again, if the pressure remains high. But if there was an existing cataract, again, I think it would be reasonable to proceed with lens extraction. But I'm probably not heading to lens-based surgery just for the management of the plateau iris, given that there is no true glaucoma at this point in time uh, quite yet. So final case, a patient with primary angle closure glaucoma has a pressure of about 35 millimeters of mercury. We can see that the, that the, um, the mechanism is lens rise, but there's no existing cataract and there is moderate visual field changes. So what would be our options? Again, choosing with these, these various cases here. All right, so consensus here is so what 42% went in the direction of lens extraction, 30% in the direction of peripheral iridotomy, some in port of, uh, of combining with ECPL and some with uh, laser peripheral iridotomy. So in this mechanism, given that the underlying the underlying pathology really is that lens rise, I'm definitely heading towards the direction of lens extraction. If there was any component that was plateau iris in nature, I would certainly consider doing an ECPL, though in this case presentation, we don't specifically outline it. It's these cases where if the pressure, you know, was 45 or the patient was on multiple drops and the pressure was still 45 with acetazolamide, for example, here you could also consider an attached angle procedure. Um, but once again, proceeding with lens extraction, I think is probably uh, the initial point if we really want to use a mechanism-based decision-making process for the management of angle closure. So with that, in conclusion, in the world of primary angle closure disease, we have primary angle closure suspects who have an anatomy with closed angles. We have primary angle closure patients who have developed some increased IOP or scar tissue. And finally, primary angle closure glaucoma who have an associated glaucomatous optic neuropathy or characteristic visual field defect. Our treatment should be based on the underlying mechanism. So whether that is laser peripheral iridotomy for the management of pupil block, lens extraction for the management of lens rise or meiotic ACE or endocyclophotocoagulopathy for patients with plateau iris with hopes of rotating that iris. The decision to proceed with intervention 
however, should be based on a risk analysis that's specific to the patient, where suspect patients should consider laser intervention, glaucomatous patients should consider incisional lens extraction with or without additional angle surgery. So thank you so much for the opportunity to present with all of you today. I'm happy to open up some questions. So yeah, first question here is, in cases of PACS or PAC with cataract, do you recommend YEG iridotomy before cataract surgery? The answer to this question for me really depends on how soon you're planning the cataract surgery. If the patient uh, is likely going for cataract surgery in the very, very short term, so you know we're talking in the order of a number of weeks or a small number of months, I don't think a YEG peripheral iridotomy is likely necessary. However, if you're, you know, they're waiting for cataract surgery, which is going to be in the order of months to years, then certainly I would consider a YEG, a YEG iridotomy and subsequently move to lens extraction or using that iridotomy kind of as a bridge to lens extraction. All right. Second question. How much of, how much of the drop of IOP after an, of an, an uneventful lens extraction? Great question. So studies have clearly shown that lens extraction in of itself, even in open angle mechanisms, not just in angle closure mechanisms, are associated with uh, a decrease in IOP. You could probably expect a change of about two to three millimeters of mercury. You probably can't expect much greater than that in open angle mechanisms. In angle closure mechanisms, you can even honestly, the, the impact of just lens extraction with lens rise based mechanisms can be out, like incredibly high even 10, 15 millimeters of mercury of a drop in patients just with lens extraction, especially if they have, you know, a, a phacomorphic lens or very, very high IOP that raised all of a sudden in an, in an angle closure crisis. Next question, which version of the anterior segment OCC system do you use for angle measurements? Okay, so great, great question. So specifically in terms of actually measuring the angle, I actually typically don't use the um, anterior segment OCT to formally measure that, that angle in a certain number of degrees. I'm really looking at what the contour of the angle and the iris is, because that I find is more valuable in determining the underlying mechanism. Um, and in a lot of cases, especially with you know the Zeiss based machines, for example, uh, a lot of that information has to be manually added in. You have to define where the scleral spur is. You have to define where different of your landmarks are. So. I, I typically actually look for a general contour and say, you know, is it kind of generally open, generally closed, and use my gonioscopy to really make that final assessment. All right, next question. Uh, what is the importance of the central corneal thickness in, in vulnerable patients to ankle closure? So the central corneal thickness is obviously a very important part of the general glaucoma assessment. It has formally been proven um, so a thin of the central of the central corneal thickness of around let's say less than 540 micrometers um, has been shown to predict glaucoma both a diagnosis of glaucoma and glaucoma progression in specifically other hypertensive patients and open angle patients. Uh, I'm sure there are studies that have looked at the role of CCT in angle closure patients. However, I'm not specifically um, knowledgeable of them here, but the initial studies that really put forth the CCT were focused primarily on open angle patients, not specifically angle closure patients. Okay, could you please show one more time how we define the lens rise on UBM? Okay, uh, what we'll do is I will just come back to that afterwards, but uh, my, my best recommendation honestly is actually to, uh, to search on um, kind of Google images actually. There's some incredible measurements on how to look at uh, the anterior posterior distance of the, when you measure from the posterior uh, cornea to the angle recess lines. And if it, if it takes up, you know, if the lens is making up, you know, greater than two thirds of that space, that's really your definition of, um, of lens rise. But there are some fantastic review papers that look at both the formal definition and, man and measurement of lens rise, but also what we call lens volt, which is an associated uh, measurement that can help us determine um, lens rise. Is PACG due to lens rise the same as phacomorphic glaucoma? Great question. So uh, honestly, this is actually a question I asked a lot of my mentors when I first started my fellowship because I had a hard time delineating the difference between the two. And honestly, in my practice, practically, I put them together. I do think that primary angle closure glaucoma in a patient with phacomorphic glaucoma, phacomorphic glaucoma, all that means is there's a large lens. 
in the setting of primary angioclosure glaucoma. So for me, the management is essentially the same. If someone has phacomorphic glaucoma, the answer for me is lens extraction. Uh, peripheral anterior sneaky will cause angioclosure glaucoma. So um, the next question here is whether or not peripheral anterior sneaky in of itself will cause angioclosure glaucoma. And the answer to that question is probably not directly. The underlying mechanism that's causing the, de the creation of the peripheral anterior sneaky probably indicates a, uh, a likelihood or a predisposition to angioclosure. And as such, the underlying risk stratification for that patient probably suggests that they are at risk for developing glaucoma in the future. So the PAS in of itself doesn't define the glaucoma. Really, you need that glaucoma dysopic neuropathy. But the fact that you have that anterior sneaky and that scar tissue does suggest that they are at risk or pretty high risk of developing angle closure in the future. Is there uh, next question is, is there any role for eye stent in lens rise related cataract surgery for PACG? Uh, so as I had kind of had mentioned before, patients that have developed angle closure glaucoma, meaning they have developed an optic neuropathy or visual field changes in the setting of angle closure, I do think there is some role for angle based surgeries like eye stent or a gonioscopy assisted transdermal trabeculotomy, the GAC that I had referenced before. Is that the primary intervention? No, I do think the primary intervention is likely if the underlying mechanism is lens rise is probably the lens extraction itself. However, if the patient is elderly and they've likely had closed angles for an extended period of time, which would be consistent with having already developed the glaucoma itself, there likely is a role for some sort of trabecular meshwork treatment in the form of angle surgery, whether that be in the form of an eye stent or a gonioscopy assisted transluminal trabeculotomy. All right, great. So the next question really has to say that, you know, there is some argument that most patients have some sort of combined mechanism glaucoma where it's both some angle closure mechanism and some underlying uh, some underlying open angle mechanism as well. And I, I, the question is whether or not, how do we prioritize? How do we determine what would be our first course of action? Is it, you know, drops like we would in the case of open angle glaucoma or is it, um, the more interventional approach of opening up the angles with laser peripheral iridotomy or lens extraction. Uh, if it's kind of, there's also a combined angle closure mechanism. And for here, I really actually go down to the semantics of the situation. In order to diagnose someone with open angle glaucoma or with an underlying trabecular metric dysfunction, they must have by definition, open angles. So, I would say without question, if I have a patient that I think or I feel has both open angle and closed angle components, the, my first priority is really actually to fix the closed angle component. Once we open up the angles, then we can start working on, on helping those angles to drain better, whether that be with you know, increased drainage systems with our prostaglandins, or if that's gonna be um, uh, treatments with filtering surgery. So. If we, have, if we are concerned about an open and a closed angle component, I manage the closed angle first. And then if they still have persistent glaucoma, they become by definition a combined mechanism glaucoma. And for that reason would then start treating the open angle component. So second question is in the cases of chronic angle closure glaucoma or primary angle closure glaucoma, if the pressure is high with glaucoma drops, would you first go with lens extraction or filtering surgery to stabilize the IOP first? So for this, really looking at a mechanism-based approach if the IOP is very high. So if we're thinking, for example, an angle closure crisis, so a patient comes in, they're you know 65 years old, they have a pressure of 55, you use drops, that pressure comes down to maybe 40. Do you want to kind of go to filtering surgery to open up the drainage system, to create a new drainage system, or do you want to go with lens-based or lens extraction? For me, the answer is always lens extraction. If it's chronic angle closure, open up the angles, manage the angles first and leave filtering surgery, whether that be in the form of trabeculectomy, filtering, uh, other filtries, tube shunts, leave that for the future. So uh, next question is, is there a comparative study assessing the effectiveness of iridoplasty and iridotomy in the setting of plateau iris? So this is a great question that really, again, comes down to the diagnostic and guide diagnosis and definition of plateau iris. So we speak of two different terms, plateau iris configuration, and plateau iris syndrome. 
Plateau iris configuration is when we have that anterior rotation of the ciliary body is associated with closed angles. And plateau iris syndrome is when we have, again, that same um, anteriorization of the ciliary body with closed angles. However, the patient has undergone a peripheral iridotomy. And the reason why we, we make that differentiation between plateau iris configuration and the syndrome is that the syndrome can only persist assuming we've gotten rid of the um, pupillary block component. So is there a comparative study? Probably not, because if a patient truly diagnosed with plateau iris syndrome, they will have necessarily undergone a peripheral iridotomy in order to ensure that we've gotten rid of the pupil block component. Okay, so question is, if we don't have access to UBM or OCTs or lasers, and really you're doing our, our, um, our assessments based on gonioscopy, what is the really the highest pressure that you would do a manual peripheral iridotomy in order to manage an acute ankle closure crisis? So if someone is in an acute ankle closure crisis and you don't have access to a YAG peripheral iridotomy, a surgical iridectomy is very reasonable. If their pressures, you know, aren't managed on drops, let's say getting even to 25 to 30, I think it would be very reasonable to consider a surgical mechanical iridectomy because that actually helps to at least stabilize the, the sulcus, um, the pressure differentiation between the sulcus and the uh, anterior chamber. But once again, if they do have an underlying uh, acute angle closure crisis, often these cases present because the patient has lens rise. So really the question is not necessarily, are you heading to a manual PI? But for me is, are they heading to lens extraction? So if you can complete lens extraction in a safe fashion there, that's the direction that typically I am heading in in those situations. What are the measures of deciding to restart anti-glaucoma medications? Uh, this has to do with um, once you've managed the mechanism, if the patient's pressure is still elevated, when do you want to start anti-glaucoma medications? It depends on the staging of the glaucoma. So in all of my patients, once I figured out that, um, that mechanism, I've managed the mechanism, and I've determined you know, they have advanced angle closure glaucoma, I'm going to do whatever it takes once I've gotten rid of that lens rise or that plateau iris configuration. I'm gonna do whatever it takes to get that pressure down to the low teens. So whether that means filtering surgery or that means starting off on drops, whether they be alpha agonists, beta blockers, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, prostaglandins. So when to restart anti-glaucoma medications, it depends on the staging. If they're advanced, anything really above you know, 12 to 13. If they're moderate level glaucoma, really anything above 16, 15 millimeters of mercury. And if they're mild glaucoma or even pre-parametric, really anything above 19 or 20. If they're just primary angle closure, meaning they have no specific glaucomatous optic neuropathy, probably heading there if they're above 21, I'll probably start using anti-glaucoma medications. Next question is, what is the role of goniosynechia lysis during cataract surgery in the presence of posterior anterior synechiae? Fantastic question. It plays a very, very large role. I would say in all patients that have posterior anterior synechiae, that are undergoing lens extraction, please complete a goniosynechiolysis. It is important to alleviate that scar tissue. And really the hope is if you alleviate that scar tissue, open up the angles, you can really help resurrect the existing drainage system. If you do not remove the posterior anterior synechiae, that angle may never open and you may still be heading in the direction of angle closure, sorry, of, of filtering surgery. So if you can do a goniosynechiolysis, I am, during cataract surgery, definitely, definitely consider it. For a lot of these patients, you even just need when you're doing cataract surgery by virtue of opening up the angle, even with um, OVD or uh, viscoelastic, that is often enough to open up and remove and release that scar tissue. So next question is, in a patient with phacomorphic glaucoma, do we decrease the pressure with mannitol or YAG before the lens extraction, or do you just go straight to lens extraction? So. I try not to do surgery in an acute or emergent setting. The, the difficulty for the patient is quite high. Um, the, the stress level of the situation is quite high. And so I do whatever I can to help reduce the pressure symptomatically in the immediate um, short term. So whether that means mannitol or acetazolamide or neptazine, I do try to use systemic medications to reduce the pressure. I don't think that a peripheral iridotomy is gonna do very much in a patient with phacomorphic glaucoma. 
However, mannitol and acetazolamide, I think, are very reasonable as dehydrating agents to help reduce the pressure as a bridge directly to lens extraction. So yes, for phacomorphic glaucoma, patients with, um, with, uh, with large lenses in a lens rise case, I'm really heading to lens extraction. So question here is which medications can increase the risk of PAC as a side effect, for example, certain psychiatric medications? Um, really anything that has anticholinergic side effects, um, any sort of uh, sympathomimetic medication associated with dilation and therefore anterior placement of the lens complex. So really there are so, so many. And when we talked a bit about the, uh, the PACS patient, so the patient that doesn't have truly um, diagnosed glaucoma, um, if they are taking psychiatric medications or if they are if they, you know, for example, have ongoing allergies and need to take sympathomimetic medications, my threshold to do that peripheral iridotomy is a little bit lower. Um, I would say, you know, if you need to be dilated regularly for diabetes checks, or if, you, if you're on these medications, more of a reason to uh, go undergo a peripheral iridotomy to help prevent an acute angle closure crisis in the future. What is your preferred management of malignant glaucoma, medical or surgical? So um, the studies have shown that 50% of malignant glaucoma cases can be managed medically, uh, plus or minus in some cases with laser. So for me, uh, my preferred method for malignant glaucoma is really to actually start off with cycloplegia and with midriatic drops. So I use atropine to help push the whole um, complex backwards. Um, if that doesn't work, I'll start off with a YAG, not iridotomy, but a YAG hyalido-iridozonulotomy to make a hole of the connection through the iris, through the zonules, and through the uh, peripheral anterior capsule of the bag. Again, this patient, you know, they really have to be um, pseudo at, at this point um, to help equilibrate the, uh, the pressures in the anterior segment as well as the posterior segment. If that fails, I absolutely will resort to surgical intervention, which typically involves, again, doing a uh, um, a iridozonular hyalodotomy to, to equilibrate that, uh, that pressure dynamic um, in the front and the back of the eye. What is the upper limit of IOP that is, un, that is safe for uneventful lens extraction in the cases of, a, of angle closure glaucoma? So really this, this kind of, I think, stems a largely in sense for what your comfort level is and experience with angle-based procedures. If the pressure, you know, a patient has a pressure of 35, even 40, I would consider doing just lens-based extraction without any attached filtering surgery or any attached angle surgery. And you would be surprised how much the pressure drops once you take that lens out. So upper limit of IOP that's safe, probably around in the 40s would be my, my kind of general go-to. However, uh, it really depends again on, on your comfort level for the procedures itself. What is the role of GAT procedures in treating angle closure glaucoma? So as we kind of had made reference to uh, before, if, my, if a patient's coming in with um, at least moderate level primary angle closure glaucoma, my primary treatment is still that lens extraction, but I will absolutely add on some sort of angle uh, procedures such as a GAT. Oh, I see one here. How do you manage PAS due to uveitis? And is PI indicated or do we just stick to cycloplegics? Great question. So. Uh, PAS secondary to uveitic glaucoma, again, a totally other beast relative to primary angle, angle closure glaucoma. However, um, peripheral iridotomy can be considered if, the, you know, there is, um, uh, if there's posterior synechiae, but if we're talking about posterior anterior synechiae, where it really is affecting the angle, I'm not sure how much a peripheral iridotomy is really going to do to open things up, because really that inflammation is what's caused that scar tissue. And so, I mean, if you want to help, you know, prevent the patient going to lens extraction and going to sneakyolysis, I think it would be reasonable to try a peripheral iridotomy, but likely that PI is not really going to open up the angles because it's not the mechanism that's driving that angle closure in the case of uveitic glaucoma with associated PAS. So with that, thank you again so much for attending the session and thank you to Orbis and the CyberSight team for inviting me. It's been a, an absolute honor and pleasure having the opportunity to speak to you uh, about uh, the management of primary angle closure. Take care, everyone, and have a great day.